Yep. So if there are any questions, uh, this is the last time you're able to ans- uh, ask any of these wonderful panelists uh, questions. So we'd like to ask that you uh, prepare your questions quickly and be ready and maybe ask for the microphone in advance. Uh, okay. Why don't you fire away? Any questions, please? Um, good afternoon to all uh, wonderful speakers. I have a question for Mr. Greg. During your early speech, you have, I have jotted down two interesting quotes that you have stated that architects are invisible and we should be politicians as much as architects. Could you please uh, elaborate more on this, please? Thank you. I think we have very little impact on society, um, and it's, it's certainly in where I come from, it's very, it's very, um, it's it's impossible, it's almost impossible to make any meaningful contribution to society, because you're 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 disconnected from the problems of society by by the state really, which is um, either dysfunctional or not not particularly interested in in doing anything other than solving uh, immediate practical problems. Um, so a- access to uh, solutions are, are really driven by politicians and, and developers who are, are, you know, who are, are our clients. Um, um, so I think if, if you want to make an impact, I think um, Politicians have access to a lot more power and influence than, than architects ever will. A, g- a good example is uh, Medellin in, in Colombia, which um, is a city that, that uh, struggled for, for many, many years. And um, at some point, uh, they got a new mayor who, had not, who was an architect. Um, and he's uh, made some quite extraordinary interventions in the city and... Um, you know, actually had a real tangible impact on on people's people's lives. So, um, yeah, maybe that's that's the answer. Politician architects. <laughs> we we have some of them here actually, <laughs> in our midst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Oh. We have a question from uh, Michael here, architect Michael, yeah, and me, then we'll proceed on. Let me ask a great question. Uh, on the, we love your open sky concept, and we love your uh, visibility view on that. One of our comments as we sit down is, uh, how do you uh, control the uh, security on, on this? Because uh, in Malaysia, especially in Sabah, security is a big issue. In fact, most of the household are living in a cage. <laughs> it's, a, it's a major issue uh, back home as well, and, and that's prob- possibly um, also one of the, the things that has driven us often to push living spaces up a level off the floor, off the ground level, and then drag, um, drag gardens up to that level, so that you can kind of live in, a, in perhaps a very false world, <laughs> disconnected from the real world uh, around you. But um, but you can, you know, deal with security by being a level up. Yeah. And we have one on the floor. Okay. Um, hi. I have a question for Mr. Takazi. Um, I have a question it's about, mostly it's about like urban design. So um, there's no urban spur in KK City, not yet. So it, to address the issue, future issue about this one. So um, what do you think about the ideas applying the Tokyo urban planning to our cities? Okay. And our cities, we have both of the elements for food doors. Yes, I think uh, that's a question, good question. And if I answer, you, you, you should not learn anything from Tokyo. <laughs> uh, we have any kind of problem. Uh, social issues, environment, overcrowded, traffic jam. We have, uh, well, since I'm Japanese, 
mass transit system never be solve anything. Well, first, uh, well, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I kind of, uh, as an architect, I sense it. This town is uh, so beautiful. You have, uh, if I mentioned a while ago, and uh, through my uh, lecture, you have a really e ingenious environment because nature, beach, and uh, uh, site of population is about right. Uh, well, that's the reason uh, uh, um, after my lecture, uh, uh, kind of coffee break, I spoke to one gentleman. He really, he and I, we agree. Don't try to uh, solve anything, uh, whatever problem in uh, uh, quadrant loop. Uh, if you remember one of our uh, uh, images, uh, uh, something uh, any country, New York and uh, Japan or even Malaysia or you know other speakers countries, always a kind of a, 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 like a capital, big city has any kind of problem we cannot solve. Well, that reason, uh, and Craig mentioned a while ago, uh, you may face since uh, 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 you must be really a, a younger professional. Uh, you cannot really uh, solve any problem as an architect. Last uh, 43 years, oh, it's about 15 years ago, I uh, uh, faced with a big uh, 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 and, uh, 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 big wall because we cannot solve anything as an architect. You have to really break through the something more facilitated. Since I have been teaching uh, almost over 30 years, you know, new generation, uh, yes, uh, fi under five years of program, we call architecture profession. We uh, 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 these day, kids has to environment, social, architecture, computer technology, do everything in five years under architecture program. So anyway, if I go back to your question, uh, if you look at your town, you know, start with the really an approach. Really, you have a nature, beach, maybe one of potential is a resort town, okay? And then, how would you solve? Uh, maybe a, 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 a to be controlled population. You cannot really over uh, 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 populate it. Uh, maybe you cannot really, uh, well, even your town might have a facing with the uh, urban sprawl. Somehow, you have to really control. Maybe along the beach, how would you go, uh, gonna uh, develop a resort? Must be controlled. Uh, as I say, maybe one of a hurricane, you know, maybe water level going up. How would you, once you develop more and more beach, or even uh, downtown area, or midtown, whatever, has to be controlled. Or did I answer your question? As a conclusion, don't lie anything in big cities. You have to solve here. <laughs> then spread out to uh, uh, Kuarandu. So they're going to solve. That's kind of my experience. Yeah, I like. Thank you. I know, that's kind of really more abstract. But I wish I could give you a specific answer. Thank you. OK, are there any more other questions? We'll give a little bit more time here since uh, it's the en end of our event. Uh, we have one more. Do we have another one on this side? Or anybody else? Do we have any? Any questions? It's OK. You can feel free to ask. <laughs> Architect Sim in the middle here. For any of you else uh, who you have questions prepared, please wave down the um, floor man management. Hello, uh, gentlemen. Really enjoying all of your talks today. Actually, this is not actually a question. Um, I'm an architect practicing in KK for the past 20 years. A lot of people who came to KK always say, wow, they love the city. You have a mountain in the back, you have the beach, you have the sea in the front. But in KK, there's lots and lots of problems that you do not know about. So, <laughs> just assuming, assuming we can overcome the political uh, issues, 
I would like to address all these all the panels to a uh, question to all the panels. What do you think about KK cities and how you can uh, what you can do to improve it? Because KK has a very long coastline. We have a mountain at the back. We have some islands in the front, but there are lots of issues like the the floating garbage in the sea that wash ashore to our beaches. We have a lots and lots of problems that if you are interested, we can bring you there to see. <laughs> but anyway, there's some, some question I'd like to ask Richard, especially as an urban designer. You Just now you talk about something like, about the decompression zone. I, I think I missed that. I'm not sure what do you mean about that decompression zone. Okay, can you elaborate on that? Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, when we're designing, when we're designing spaces, we need to sometimes manipulate people. <clears throat> it's a pathway to somewhere. Um, so, in nature, a pathway might slow you down, or it might speed you up. Um, it might make you stop and pause to look at a view. In, in my, the work that I do with shopping mall designs, we use it to control people in a way that makes them spend more money or less money. <clears throat> so in this, in this organic, this, a shopping mall is organic because it always changes, it's never, it's never static. Um, the insides of a shopping mall are always fluctuating. This year you've got a cinema, next year it's a bowling alley. It, it, things are always changing. So when we, we compress people and decompress people to create energy, because inside a shopping mall you must create energy and excitement for people, because that's the concept of it all. And so you create quiet spaces, that's decompression. So for example, in KL, in Surya KLCC, facing the park, There's, they've created this, the Mexican architect created this beautiful park uh, with a lake that um, Dr. Mahat here wanted this park to inspire the village people. And so when that shopping mall first opened, people would come from the kampongs into this big building and it was wonderful watching the elderly people and the children for the first time step on an escalator. So it was causing traffic jams inside because they didn't know how to put the foot on the escalator. The escalator would run away and this little, little child would end up <laughs> running down the escalator with his mother chasing him. And so originally the face of the building facing this beautiful lake was never designed for any function other than some awnings to keep the rain off as you walked around the perimeter of the building. And then some smart person said, well, you know, Malaysians love living outside. Everybody eats outside and drinks outside. So they got rid of these awnings and turned it into what they now call cafes on the park. So they opened up the face of the building, looking at the water, into all these cafes and restaurants. That's a decompression zone. When you're inside the building, you've got to move. These buildings take maybe between 50 and 100,000 people a day. Yeah? So there's a lot of people moving through the spaces, going in different directions and different places. So um, they lease, when, they, when they build these shopping malls, they lease them. And they, the leasing people decide where you're going to have energy and where you're going to have not so much energy. So you'll have one floor will be just youth. So all the young people go to that area. You've got youth fashion, you've got IT, you've got all these functions. So that particular part of the shopping mall will be very, very high energy. The music, everything that's happening is, is you know, TV screens, flashing information, and, and so that's high energy. So that's, that's getting people excited. Um, as you move around these spaces, sometimes you need to rest. So in shopping malls, they don't, 
provide a lot of furniture to sit down on. They don't want you to sit down. If you sit down, you're not spending money. So you've got to keep moving all the time. Keep moving. You keep moving all the time, you get tired. So then you create little areas that like a section in the mall that has cafes, some nice bistros, you know, that's decompression. Once you've decompressed and you're relaxed, your mind is now thinking shopping, spend money. <laughs> so that's how we manipulate people. We get them energetic, slow them down, decompress. Uh, and it's the same it's the same, the same principles work within your city here. When you're planning the place, you want people to, this part, like your waterfront down there, you've got some bars, I think, yeah, on the waterfront? Yeah. That's a high energy place. You know, and after you've been there, you want to go somewhere quiet and relax, decompress huh, before you go home. So that's, yeah, we manipulating spaces to control people. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Keep the questions rolling. Yep, one at the back there. It's great we have a high representation, uh, rep representation from young professionals. <laughs> Hi. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Irving. I have a question for Mr. Nguyen Mant. I love the image of, of the spa with the curtains of plants coming down from the, from the void, the central courtyard space. And I love how your work is very interconnected with nature. Um, I, I, if I have the chance, I would love to do something like that. But just from a pragmatic point of view, if we're so interconnected with nature, I think Definitely, there'll be you know, insects or pests or mosquitoes coming in since we're in a tropical climate. Do you have a method of dealing with that? Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. You know, this is a resort. So they have the team to go into for maintenance. And you, if you see carefully in the movie that I show, and I accept the insect to live on the project, and the bird is singing in the morning, at the same time, the insects can come and enjoy it, not only human. <laughs> insect resort. <laughs> and this is the... Uh, to keep the balance between nature and the place, the people, the human take place, take the space from the nature. And of course, in a certain degree, the security design had to, to consider, of course. Um, but in general, that is one of the ideas to be very strong that human living in the nature. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Any more? Let's have another two and then we'll call it a day. Any more questions? Another one? Hi, it's me again. By the way, my name is Yang, and I have a question for Mr. Nguyen. So during your earlier presentation, you have shown us the uh, Dongda Waterfront Park, and you mentioned it's uh, an ecological lake, and it's polluted. It's slum surrounding, and all the rubbish has been dumped to the lake. This is uh, one of the key 
um, issues that we also face in our city. So I would like to ask, what was the most challenging area and part that you have faced um, during the design development process? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Do you know the resident facing to the lake with the, how to call it, in the waterway uh, frontage house? But it's certain things, it's had the value of the view, but only for themselves, not for community. And there is, um, you know, the illegal, you know, at the slum, they occupy more and more and fill in, make the, 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 the lake smaller and smaller. That's its... Uh, um, illegal, what we call, how we call Islam. But in Vietnam, um, by law, even you don't have the title in your property, but they say by law after five years, if you live in your property and nobody touch it, means this is your property. You have the right. Right? This is the situation. Even a slum. Even a slum. So, if you want to relocate them, you have to come and talk nicely. Parent, the kid, and three or four generations in the house. And this is one of the difficulty. The authority... The government, they cannot do anything about after seven years because there is a conflict between the people who are living there with amount of the fund for the people to be relocated. It's only private company, they come and they say, okay, your house, you have the uh, water frontage, but your house, not good. Right now, the depth of your house, 25 meters. So why don't you think you make it on 20? And then I give you a park. How do you think? And you have money of five meters. This is money. Tomorrow, it's going to be in your bank account. Right? So, lack of open space, lack of the place for the children, lack of the place for the people taking the wedding photo. This is what happening after project done. So, it's only things you have to be a part of the society. You have to step on their side and to speak with them on their, um, their own benefit. And you show them your interest to be for themselves and for the overall society, then you might succeed. Thank you. Okay, very quickly, one last question before we adjourn. Hello, uh, I'm Vivian. I have a question to ask Mr. Gray. We can see your design uh, residential houses very bold and memorizing. We would like to ask like the um, wide opening structure or those, how did it come about, the ideas? Uh, wide spanning structures. Um, I, I suppose we've just pushed engineers to kind of <laughs> do it. <laughs> and um, I, sp I suppose it's like many things, you know, people um, fall into patterns and ways of doing things. So 
Um, it's difficult sometimes to co conceive of different ways of, of doing things, and engineers are often creatures of habits. So. <laughs> Um, our experience has been that um, as soon as you get an engineer engaged with, with design and actually thinking about solutions, um, all sorts of things become possible. <laughs> so um, I suppose that's a, a lesson. Push the people around you as well to do, to do things that aren't, aren't ordinary. Great. Great. Well, oh, we have one last one over here. <laughs> now we're getting warmed up. <laughs> Sharon? Okay. Okay, this question is to all of the speakers because I noticed that actually how your topic eventually interrelated and then the conclusion that I have is that everybody is saying either architect need to be a politician or you need to have a politician, or you say community need to be involved, they're going to be one guy, become a leader eventually. And just now, I cannot find anything about politician with Mr. Nguyen, but on the last statement, you're mentioning how somebody have to step in and help, and it also like something like telling us, oh, you need a politician as well, okay. So my question is, there's a lot of problem, not only in Malaysia, I believe in all of your country from where you come from. What is the, is there any effort actually to educate our future politician or our current politician? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. If there's anybody who wants to comment, please feel free. <laughs> well, I think um, part of the challenge for us is to get the message out there and to have a, a, a bigger conversation with um, society. So events like this are fantastic, um, and maybe one of the challenges is to figure out how, how um, other members of the public actually start getting in interested in design and, and, and architecture and start motivating um, for solutions. Um, I think what Richard was talking about does suggest a lot of the solutions, which is, is letting uh, communities take ownership of, of, of their environments and find their own solutions. Um, where I come from, I feel very oh, the, 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 um, they don't have any sense that they can do that. So yeah, I think that's our challenge. Uh, just an example in Australia, um, the education has come through, we have um, federal government, state government, local council, and a shire council. Shire council is like a kampong council here in Malaysia. It's for remote communities. And so our politicians are really people who have good intentions. It's somebody from the community who just wants to do good for the community, but then he gets lost in a system. It's a bureaucratic system because that's how our government works in Australia. He gets lost in a, in a bureaucratic system with lots of paperwork and things that slow the process down. So what we've found over the years, I don't know if this is intentional or it's happened nat naturally, but our politicians now are coming with an education. Before it was a farmer, a businessman, a truck driver, who was interested in his community and would join the political system. Now we've got mayors of towns who have degrees in political science and economics and other fancy, fancy names. And they're bringing a different perspective to the council. They've been to university, they've studied social behaviour and all this, and they've come with armed with a different knowledge now. And they're actually changing the way the rest of the council thinks. So we have somebody now that's come out of university, has worked in a profession, decides he wants to do something good for his community, works his way up to become the mayor, 
And because of his knowledge, he then drags everybody else up with him, with knowledge. And so I'm finding now in our local councils, we actually have um, not smarter people, but better educated people who make better decisions that are good for our communities. And that's just education. Huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, frankly speaking, I always, and since I have been teaching uh, many years, always a student asks me, Professor, should I be an architect or a politician? <laughs> and yes, uh, and then I said, no, no way. Uh, you don't have to be a politician, but uh, since everybody is speaking uh, their own country, so let me start with the Japanese. Yes, most of Ando and Kumakengo. Fujimoto so those are really very politician. Uh, because uh, in Japan, really highly comparative uh, speaking arch architectural professions. As I mentioned a while ago, and through my uh, 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 slide presentation, most of major construction company, house maker, and over controlling housing, and uh, uh, whatever high rise building. So, you know, those kind of uh, architect can do something, you know, more uh, 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 um, unique uh, architect. Some architect does glass box. Some architect does a, a concrete building something. Even doesn't belong to our uh, uh, natural environment, you know. But, uh, however, in the U.S., instead of a politician, one thing I learned, maybe some of you uh, educated in, in the U.S., uh, I was educated how to sell your idea, how to sell whatever your presentation. The key word is how to sell uh, 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 your design. So you don't have the politician. Once you have a philosophy, concept, drawings, just a fly. So I understand since you kind of, uh, especially, you know, younger pro uh, 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 professional, and they are so worried about what's going on five years, 10 years. Uh, I always tell my students, you don't have to be active. If you don't like it, if you don't, you know, and money, and politician, something, just drop it up. One thing, since you study architecture, you can be any kind of professional. I'm, I'm very proud of myself being an educator. And through my experience, always tell, you don't have to make up anything architecture. Make something philosophy. Like uh, one of my uh, mentors, like uh, uh, Honda Soichiro, he's an excellent uh, craftsman because uh, regarding uh, automobile. He said, whatever you make pieces, need a philosophy. Only technology can fly without philosophy. Well, I hope uh, I gave you an answer. I hope I can see you in five years, so you will see. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, uh, this is the amount of uh, sick people. Sorry, I'm coming from the communist country. <laughs> Although I hate it. But I'm talking a way that had no connection between politicians. In the way, only problem, no solution. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about the bad situa politician situation in my country. But the country has been built by the power and corruption. And therefore, it's so difficult for architect to be to do something right. 
So that's the difficult. What you are seeing here surrounding and what we can do in our country might be 10 times different. And then, developer had the most powers, even control to a politic, to the governor, to do things they want to do. For instance, the master plan, one, one thousand, two thousand, they say this is parking. But reality, the guy pay more money, can you clean up the, the park for me? I paid you that much. Master plan automatically changed, no control by the developers. So, architect, what we can we do about it? We say, if no park, no life. So we create our own park in our own property. And this is a big message to talk to authority, to talk to the government, and to talk to a developer. You have to do something before it's too late. So that is the situation in my country. Sorry, no connection with politics. Ladies and gentlemen, now that concludes our question and answer session. There will be plenty of opportunity for you to be able to speak to them out in the foyer. We'd encourage you to do so, befriend them, get their contact, maybe visit them in their country or have your personal discussion or ask them questions personally. Now, uh, that ends the official part of our, um, uh, our session today. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't we give a final round of applause to our wonderful speakers who have come here today. We thank you so much.